pleasure for me to be here. I represent um, class four, um, and I'm a member of uh, section uh, 43, and also uh, a, a secondary in 41. So I'm an immunologist. I study the interaction of the immune system with cancer. And what I'd like to do in my talk today is tell you a little bit of a story, which was how this subject of uh, immune system cancer interactions basically what resulted in a hundred year controversy that we, uh, uh, at least in some part, helped to resolve. And then to show you how once this issue is resolved, how one can begin to really freely move forward to use the immune system uh, therapeutically against cancer. So first a little history. So about a hundred years ago, Paul Ehrlich, who was a grand and founding father of, uh, of immunology, proposed that the immune system should be able to control cancer uh, in long-lived uh, organisms. However, so, such a little amount was known about the composition and the function of the immune system at the turn of the 20th century that the field would really have to wait about 50 years before this possibility could be considered any further. In the early 1960s, uh, McFarland Burnett, seen on the left, and Lewis Thomas, uh, seen on the right, uh, formalized this concept by proposing the term cancer immunosurveillance to, um, to specify that the immune system should be able to see transformed cells essentially immediately upon transformation and destroy them long before they became clinically apparent. The key thing on the cancer immunosurveillance hypothesis was they predicted that a specific immune cell, a T cell, a member of the adaptive immune system, was going to be the most, effect, most important effector cell um, in this function. Now, in retrospect, there was actually very little experimental evidence to support the concept of cancer immunosurveillance. Uh, but nevertheless, it actually made a lot of sense to the extent that many in the scientific and medical fields jumped on the cancer immunosurveillance bandwagon in a relatively uncritical uh, manner. But nevertheless, it became generally accepted uh, very quickly. Within 10 years, however, Osias Stutman, who interestingly was a member of Lewis Thomas's own department, could put the concept of cancer immunosurveillance to the experimental test. Basically what had happened was advances had occurred within the fields of immunology, cancer biology, and mouse genetics, and allowed Stutman to uh, predict then that if cancer immunosurveillance actually occurred, then mice with defects in their immune system should show higher cancer rates for both spontaneous and carcinogen-induced cancers compared to their normal counterparts. And when he tested this hypothesis, in fact, he could find no evidence that cancer immunosurveillance existed. And so just as uncritically as the field had jumped onto the cancer immunosurveillance bandwagon, they jumped off. And by uh, the middle of the 1970s, then, uh, the idea of cancer immunosurveillance was essentially abandoned. So for the next 20 years, the fields of immunology and cancer biology essentially turned their backs on the idea of cancer immunosurveillance and came up with many theoretical arguments why this function, why this process could uh, never really ever occur. Now my entrance into this field occurred in 1979 when I did a sabbatical from my position at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla with Emil Unanue who at that time was um, at the Harvard Medical School in the Department of Pathology. And my goal there was to learn cellular immunology. Um, in Amel's lab, I began to work with a function, a, 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 an activity made by activated lymphocytes that when applied to other cells of the immune system could activate them and allow them to uh, kill tumor cells. So when I returned to Scripps, I decided that this was a very interesting molecule. I became fascinated in it, and I began to go after it with the kind of biochemical approaches that I was trained to do. And so we purified this functional activity, 
showed, in fact, that it was identical to a newly cloned molecule known as gamma interferon, which was one of these cytokines, these immune hormones that activated many cells in the immune system. We made some of the first monoclonal antibodies against this protein, and then using these antibodies in mouse models, we began to study the biology of gamma uh, interferon. Now, in uh, 1985, Emil moved to uh, Washington University in St. Louis to take over the chair of the Department of Pathology and recruited me there, and I've been there ever since. As you can see from my career, I don't move around very much. But nevertheless, gamma interferon has become a central focus of my uh, career and basically has uh, focused me uh, at the level of uh, tumor immunology. Now, my real entrance into this field um, occurred with another phone call, one from uh, Lloyd Old in 1988, who had asked whether or not we would be interested in working with him to examine the different roles of different cytokines in the immune rejection of this famous tumor that he had developed called methe, a, um, a chemically induced sarcoma uh, in mice. And our first experiment was, by sheer luck, a complete home run. And what we had shown, in fact, was that when you put this tumor into an animal, but you now blocked gamma interferon that was endogenously produced in this animal with this antibody that we had generated, this tumor cell was no longer rejected. And so this told us, I think, some of the first evidence that this molecule that we had fallen in love with, which was gamma interferon, was in fact playing a major role in host protection uh, against tumors. Now remember, this is occurring at a time when the field rejected that the immune system could even see tumors. But our data was coming out just at the same time as other evidence was beginning to uh, appear that suggested that the Stuckman experiments probably needed to be reconsidered. Specifically, the specific immunodeficient mouse that Stuttman used in his experiments, which was a CBAH uh, uh, nude mouse, nude because it was hairless, but it actually had an immunodeficiency, um, was uh, subsequently shown not to be completely immunodeficient um, and were therefore not ideal models of uh, immunodeficiency. Also at that time, what it developed was the ability of manipulating the genome of a mouse, and so many different kinds of immunodeficient mice uh, were developed that had much better and well-characterized immunodeficiencies. And finally, antibodies were developed that you could go in even to a normal mouse and destroy some of their immune cells or block some of their immune uh, soluble molecules and also render them uh, immunodeficient. And then finally, the idea of what it was that the immune system was seeing, that is, antigens in the tumor, and tumor-specific antigens, were just beginning to be defined uh, at that time. And so a couple of labs, ours included, decided that maybe it was worthwhile using these better reagents to re-examine whether the immune system, in fact, could control cancer. And so this was the first experiment that we performed in this area. Here we took large quantities of wild-type uh, normal immunocompetent mice or various types of immunodeficient mice, and these were all genetically and sex and age uh, matched mice. And we treated them with a carcinogen. In this case, we used uh, the chemical carcinogen methylcholanthrene. And then we followed tumor formation at the site of injection over time. And what you can see here on the right is when you inject the carcinogen, into immunocompetent wild-type mice. At this dose of carcinogen, these mice could resist tumor formation. Whereas when you injected the carcinogen into immunodeficient mice, we here we used a mouse that lacked an enzyme that's required for the development of immune receptors. And so these mice lacked T cells, B cells, and NK T cells. You see you got more tumors more rapidly compared to the wild-type counterparts. So this experiment said, in fact, that Stutman was wrong, that when you do and you look in the right way with the right reagents, and he didn't have these reagents at the time, you could actually show that the immune system was capable of protecting the host, at least against certain types of cancers. 
But it turns out that this was not the whole answer. When you looked at the tumors themselves that formed in the presence or absence of a full immune system, they differed qualitatively in their immunogenicity. Specifically, when you looked at tumor cells that came from methylcholanthrene treated normal mice, you see when you injected these cells into either immunodeficient mice or wild type mice, these cells could always form progressively growing cancers. But when you made tumors in immunodeficient mice to begin with, there were clearly tumors because when you injected the tumor cells into immunodeficient mice, they grew. That's one of the definitions of a cancer. But when you injected them into wild type immunocompetent mice, the immune system saw these tumors and could destroy at least many of these different tumors. So these results told us that tumors from these immunodeficient mice were highly immunogenic, and we called these tumors unedited, and thus they were good models of nascent tumors, the kind of tumor cell that would have just formed before it interacted with the immune system. Whereas tumors from wild-type mice displayed reduced immunogenicity, we called them edited, and thus they are models of the clinically apparent mature tumors that a physician would see in the clinic uh, in a cancer patient. So taken together, we proposed, in fact, that the immune system wasn't only protective. In fact, it did two things. It protected the host against cancer, but if it failed to do so, it shaped the immunogenicity of tumors that formed and therefore promoted cancer development. And for this reason, we realized that the term cancer immunosurveillance was more of the problem than the actual process. And so we renamed the concept cancer immunoediting, but expanded its scope. And here you can see an example of how we're thinking of cancer immunoediting. We think of it as an extrinsic tumor suppressor model that engages only after cellular transformation has occurred and intrinsic tumor suppressors like P53 and RB have failed. In its most complex form, cancer immunosurveillance immunoediting exists in three phases. The first is elimination. This you'll recognize as a modernization of the older concept of cancer immunosurveillance, but now taking into account that both innate and adaptive immunity need to work together in order to recognize a developing tumor and destroy it long before it becomes clinically apparent. We understood, however, that the immune system might not be able to kill all the tumor cells, and envisaged at that time that these residual tumor cells might enter into a second phase that we called equilibrium, a time in which the immune system was able to keep the cells in a relatively dormant state, not allowing them to expand, but nevertheless um, keeping them under strict growth control. We hypothesized that editing, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, actually occurred in equilibrium. And if the editing went to an extent that the tumor cell no longer could be controlled, could be seen by the immune system and therefore could not be controlled, the tumor cells began to expand. They entered into the third phase that we called escape, uh, developed a immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, and then emerged as the clinically apparent cancers that we uh, know as the manifestation of the disease. Now, whereas this was a good idea, we were a little bit at fault that we had not been able to show experimentally the existence of the equilibrium phase. And so that was done a few years later by another student in the lab who basically took our, our uh, primary tumor formation model and modified it as you can see here. Now we're working with completely immunocompetent wild type mice. And here we take a very low dose of the carcinogen we inject it into the mice and we choose the dose so that only about 20% of the group that are injected with the carcinogen ever really develop clinically apparent cancers. So these mice that develop uh, these cancers are removed and used for other experiments. And what you're left with is about 80% of the group that had been exposed to a carcinogen but had not yet developed an apparent cancer. So after waiting 200 days and ensuring that these mice did not develop progressively growing cancers, we divided the group in half. Half we took and just treated with control 
monoclonal antibody. The other half we took and treated with monoclonal antibodies that wiped out their immune system, that destroyed their T cells and, and blocked gamma interferon. And then we followed tumor formation uh, over time. So here's the results of that experiment. You can see in the top panels, this is the control group. These are 16 mice that have been treated with low-dose methylcholanthrene. You see three out of the 16 mice develop cancers in the 200-day um, uh, observation period. When you take the remaining 13 mice and treat them then with a control antibody, leaving their immune system intact, no tumors emerge from these mice. But in the bottom panel, what you can see is here's 19 of the same mice treated in the same way. Four out of the 19 mice develop cancers in the 20-day period, 200-day period. They're removed from the experiment, and now you have 15 mice and now you render them immunodeficient. You deplete their immune cells, and you block their gamma interferon. And what you can see here in the red lines is, in fact, that, that uh, nine out of the 15 mice, or 60% of these mice, basically were harboring these dormant tumors that when you eliminated the immune system, now they could grow out and become clinically apparent. And so this told us, in fact, that this this phase of equilibrium did occur, it raises the interesting issue whether we're not all walking around a bit with these dormant cancers that our immune systems are keeping in check. And this is perhaps one of the reasons that cancer is seen more frequently in the elderly when, in fact, our immune systems begin to break down. Now, of course, everything I've shown you has been at the level of a mouse. And so, whereas these experiments began to get some acceptance in the field, people would still say, well, you know, maybe this is just a mouse issue. Humans, there's no evidence for this in humans. But actually, over the years, there's been a significant amount of co cl compelling clinical data that's been obtained that shows, in fact, that, that cancer patients frequently develop immune responses to the cancers that they bear and very beautiful work by Jerome Galland and Will Friedman in Paris have shown, in fact, that you can often predict the outcome of a cancer patient's clinical course by looking at the quality and quantity of immune infiltrates uh, into their tumors. And so together, this work basically has led to an acceptance of the concept of cancer immunoediting. Um, and a great deal of work has gone on since in terms of looking at all the other cells and molecules that are involved in the process. Now, probably 30% of this slide is reality, 70% is fantasy, but basically a lot of this has been taken from what we now have learned also about the workings of the immune system. And this le has led, I think, to a generalized acceptance of the concept that the immune system indeed sees cancer as it develops and can alter uh, that uh, the, the cancer um, in, in one way or another, either protecting against it or shaping the cancer such that it actually can uh, grow out. Now, this work then um, uh, really raised two questions. And that is, what we did is we knew now a lot about the cells and molecules that went into the cancer immunoediting process. We knew about the phases. But the one thing that we really didn't know is what were the targets of cancer immunoediting and how did this occur. And so three years ago, we began to examine this. And two years ago, back-to-back -back papers appeared that resolved this issue. And I think the significance of this not only was the information that I'll tell you about in a moment, but maybe for the first time, you have back-to-back -back papers by an immunologist and a cancer biologist saying exactly the same thing. And so, our data then was summarized for you here. We reasoned that it would be nice to be able to go in and get a rapid look and definition of the antigens within a tumor in order to study the cancer immunoediting process. And we were struck by the, um, the suggestion that was made a few years ago by Jim Allison and Bert Vogelstein, and Bert, I think, is speaking at this meeting in a day or two, uh, that, in fact, said that since all tumors are now known to harbor mutations, some of these mutations may actually act as antigens for the immune system. The immune system would see the antigen as a foreign protein. And so together with Elaine Martis, who's our colleague in the Genome Institute at Washington University, 
we sequenced uh, this tumor, uh, we refined the in silico methods that, uh, that allowed us to predict which of these mutations uh, would uh, form uh, the antigens responsible for the high immunogenicity. And then we could show that immunoediting of these tumors by the immune system was the selection of, by the immune system against these tumor cells that had these uh, strong antigens. And so I think that, um, that this work uh, has uh, set up the possibility that we might be able to use genomics and bioinformatics approaches to go after now antigens within tumors um, and, and, and use them as vaccines uh, to, to treat cancers. And I'll just stop here by saying that that's uh, precisely what we are uh, now looking at. And I'll end here by, um, I think, uh, showing you the cover of uh, science from uh, the December issue of last year, which says that we are entering now a new age of the consideration of the immune system interacting with cancer. We no longer have to argue about whether it does the immune system sees cancer, but rather now how best to use the immune system to treat cancer. So I'll stop here and just acknowledge the fact that I've been incredibly fortunate, especially in my time at Washington University. I've had a large number of incredibly talented trainees. Um, we've been lucky that our funding has been uh, stable. Um, this is the current lab who are now performing the transition of the lab from a basic immuno tumor immunology lab into one that's doing cancer immunotherapy. I think the key of our success is we start our people really early. <laughs> We also have an incredible community, both in Washington University as well as my colleagues uh, elsewhere who have helped. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the support of my family. We're Apple fans, and so we're calling this the McSchreiber clan. So thank you very much. <laughs>